have some bad news. I'm here to scare the hell out of you. I mean, that's what the media does, right? So it must be the way to talk about cybersecurity, is to, to scare the hell out of you. I don't think so. And I, I actually think that's why we have a shortage of what I call security ninjas. Security ninjas being people in the cybersecurity profession that are here to protect us from cybersecurity threats. I'm very passionate about cybersecurity. It's something I've literally been doing more than half my life. And I'll take you through that journey very shortly. But we're screwed. That's more bad news. We don't have enough cybersecurity professionals. And if I leave here having recruited just one of you, I've done my job. So before I scare the hell out of you, let me tell you a little bit about myself. It would only be rude not to. I was born in Poland. My parents moved me to the US when I was uh, three years old. Shortly thereafter, they had actually divorced. And my mom met my stepdad. My mom worked at uh, a factory that produced lights for uh, airplanes. So the strobe lights that, she, that you see on airplanes, she would hand, uh, hand produce. And after hours, uh, her and my stepdad actually ran a cleaning service, uh, one that they'd go in, uh, clean offices, and, and uh, yeah, Polish family, I kind of get it. So after, uh, at the light factory, my dad was actually the manager. We had uh, uh, moved out of, of the town that they were actually doing this work, and, and my dad started this business full time. And so he was cleaning offices, oftentimes medical offices, and unfortunately, uh, as you guys know, medical offices can't be cleaned during the day, so they'd have to be cleaned at night. So my parents would have to bring me along as an eight-year-old, nine-year-old child into these uh, doctor's offices, and what am I supposed to do, right? So apparently, for some reason, nurses, doctors have this tendency of using the stapler and missing the paper. I don't know how it happens, but staples end up in the carpet, jammed into the carpet. And the vacuum cleaner we had was pretty busted and could not actually pick up those staples. So my dad, my stepdad made me a deal. Why don't you go around while we clean into the uh, doctor's office, and I'll give you a penny for every staple you pull out of the actual uh, carpet. And I said, all right. So that's how I became an entrepreneur. Uh, I, I, shortly, uh, thereafter <laughs> I shortly thereafter resigned. Uh, the pay was not that great. My, uh, we're still on good terms, my parents and I. So that's how I learned how to be an entrepreneur. However, at one time, my parents did catch me in uh, one of the side offices with a stapler in my hand, uh, making extra cash, and that's how I learned ethics. So, so cybersecurity, uh, you, you gotta be ethical, cybersecurity, you kinda get the point. So that's number one. Okay, so how did Malwarebytes get started? Malwarebytes, Malwarebytes, Malwarebytes. Okay, so I was uh, 13, 14 years old, loved to pirate video games, everybody here's done it, don't look at me like that. Uh, and, and pirating these video games is, is risky business. Back in the day, we had LimeWire, we had uh, uh, Kazaa, I think many, hopefully many of you have uh, used those products before. Uh, but you can download a lot of uh, free stuff. Today there's torrents, but back in the day, these video games would come with malware. Uh, it was a 50-50 shot. So I downloaded a, a video game, and unfortunately had gotten the parents' computer infected. We shared one computer, one of those Dells under the table. And I didn't know what to do. I felt helpless. Um, obviously my parents were, were upset, and, and this, we, we had the best antivirus money could pay for. How could this have happened? How could the best security software money could pay for running on my computer have gotten my computer infected. Had no idea. So I went online, I searched for my symptoms, and, and I found a group of volunteers helping people like me remove malware from their computer and doing it so for free. These people were heroes, and I wanted to be one of those heroes. So after three days of, of working with these people online, my computer was clean, everything was happy, and I decided to stick around that community. I built automation into some of the processes that they had been running. And somebody gifted me the Malwarebytes domain name. I actually thought it was pretty cheesy. Today I actually love it. Um, and I stuck around this community and, and met a guy named Bruce Harrison. Bruce was this 35-year-old guy in the middle of uh, Massachusetts. And he would drive an hour uh, to work to clean computers. I mean, his whole role at this tech repair shop was computers would come in with a virus. He would manually remove it after several hours. And it was very anticlimactic the start to Malwarebytes. I just said, do you want to build an antivirus? And he said yes. So that's how we got started. Now imagine telling your mother, your 14-year-old kid, that you met a guy online. And together, and he's 35, and together, you're going to build an antivirus. Now imagine telling your wife that you met a kid online that's 14, and together, we're going to build an antivirus. Somehow it worked. We hadn't actually met uh, for a couple of years until, uh, until the company got going. Anyway, 
So the start to Malwarebytes was quite an interesting one. Today we're about 500 people uh, worldwide. We're based in Santa Clara. I actually moved here from, from Chicago, went to the University of uh, Champaign, University of Illinois in Champaign. The whole point of that story is there's a lot of threats out there. And the traditional antivirus, the traditional security approaches are no longer working. They're, they're failing, in fact. The reason is malware used to be lame. I don't know if many of you, uh, you look young, but, and I look young, but I don't know if many of you remember when internet search toolbars were our biggest problem, where we'd open Internet Explorer and half of our screen was search toolbars. I don't know if any of you remember Bonsai Buddy. Anybody here remember Bonsai Buddy? No. Bonsai Buddy was a purple gorilla that would infect your computer, jump around on your screen, and try to sell you stuff all day long. Those were the threats of 2005 through 2010. Those were the threats we were dealing with. Those were the threats that traditional security was designed to, to fix and protect against. And the pace of innovation by those criminals has far exceeded the pace of innovation of security ninjas, or, or rather the lack of security ninjas. I, I firmly believe there's not enough of us to keep up with that innovation. Let's level set. Let's talk about some of the problems of today. Um, I actually think they're, they're far more advanced than many people think. I think the media uses fear to portray a lot of the threats out there, but I don't think they do it with clarity, and so I think I'll give it a shot. One of the biggest threats that I think faces society today is, uh, are exploits, and exploits are really a vector of attack, a method by which a criminal can do something that they want to do. I'll give you an example, or rather, let me tell you a little bit more about exploits. So, software engineers write tens of thousands of lines of code. Software engineers are not perfect. Therefore, one, two, or many of those lines of code uh, could cause issues for the software application. Imagine the most fundamental applications that we use, a browser, for example. A browser's only job is to take content from the web, parse it, sanitize it, clean it up so you can see pictures, graphs, text, and so on. If it's built poorly, that browser could parse the information incorrectly and do something to your computer that it does not desire to do. And that's what an exploit is. It's the use of a vulnerability uh, to basically do something malicious to that machine. Now, the most severe cases of this are nation states, governments using exploits to target individuals like us, other nation states. If you guys remember Stuxnet, Stuxnet was the first virus that actually went after infrastructure. It got delivered uh, and, and destroyed Iranian centrifuges, allegedly by uh, Americans, uh, by the United States of America. And it used four zero-day exploits that were unknown at the time. If you look at the hacking team, really bad company name, but the hacking team was a company in Italy that mass, not mass produced, mass distributed exploits that only they knew about to nation states to use as attacks. So they got hacked, the hacking team got hacked, and those exploits, the only revenue source that they had was now public and companies fixed it. They were gutted overnight. But I, I do believe that the use of these exploits in browsers, in office products, uh, in your cars, the jailbreak on the iPhone is the use of an exploit. Now we use it to jailbreak our iPhones, criminals use it to read our emails, to read our text messages. Which brings me out uh, to the next threat, which is ransomware. A little bit more familiar, I hope, to the group here. So ransomware is basically a piece of malware that could be delivered via an exploit or you just clicking on it, and it encrypts all of your documents, takes everything that you have on your computer that's really important to you, and locks it with military-grade encryption. And then brings up a little prompt that says, if you don't pay me $500 in the next 24 hours, your data is gone. Now imagine being a student working on your PhD, and you come back to your computer with a prompt that says, if you don't pay me $500, your PhD is gone, and you don't have backups of it. Now the FBI had changed their mind uh, a little bit on this. They said, first pay the ransom, then don't pay the ransom. Now this is a several hundred million dollar industry. This is not a friend of a family member that, that I know that got infected with ransomware. This is a tens of millions of people globally, hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more. It's an economy, and it's becoming uh, very, very 
uh, business-like. There's ransomware as a service. I can get any one of you online today selling ransomware, or rather getting money through ransomware. We would buy a ransomware kit. We would buy an exploit kit. We would do some advertising, and by the end of the day, we have, we have victims. And that's how easy it is to get into this game, and that's the pace of innovation around ransomware. Now, the next th threat I want to talk about, and hopefully I'm succeeding in scaring you a little bit here, the next threat I want to talk about is botnets. Again, uh, yet another misunderstood threat. A botnet is machines worldwide acting as zombies, ready to be pointed at a target and to take that target down. There are hundreds of millions of computers today that are part of botnets where the owner of the device has no idea. And at the command of the person that owns the botnets, they point it at an asset, like a website or a server, and take it down through just the sheer amount of traffic. If they wanted to take the White House website down today, I assure you they could. And just recently, uh, actually two weeks ago, the first botnet attacked the internet backbone that used IoT devices, refrigerators, Barbie dolls, video cameras. We are a society that connects everything to the internet. Why is a Barbie doll connected to the internet? I answer that question. I have no idea why a Barbie doll is connected to the internet, but it's part of an attack. It's part of an attack today. And these devices are created without cybersecurity in mind. They are provisioned with default credentials, username, admin, password, password. That's not really hard to discover, is it? And these criminals wrote a little script that scoured the entire internet looking for those kinds of devices, routers, uh, Barbie dolls, video cameras, with default credentials like admin and password, and made them part of the botnet. And they pointed it at Dyn, which is basically the lookup table of what converts an IP address to a domain. Google.com has a bunch of numbers on the back end that you never want to know about. And they took the internet down for a full day. Reddit, Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, all of these websites had connectivity issues that day. That was disrupting business, and that's what all this is about. It's about money. All right, so talked a little bit about the threats of today. We went from bonsai buddy to that in eight years. You got to admit, that's some pretty fast innovation. What, what does the next eight years hold? I mean, I, I can only speculate, but the amount of attacks that are occurring today and you hear about in the news is just the, 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 the scratching the surface. Imagine a botnet being utilized against United Airlines' ticketing system. United Airlines' ticketing system produces hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue per day. Imagine if you can take it down for a full day. Would United Airlines not pay $5 million instead of $100 million just to make the attack stop? Using botnets for ransom, this happened with the SF Muni. I don't know if you guys remember six weeks ago, the SF Muni, the ticket kiosk, completely taken down using ransomware. You come up to the machine and it basically said, we will not let you use this machine until they pay the ransom. This is affecting our everyday lives and these criminals need to be stopped. Now imagine it also going after infrastructure. We've already seen that it's, it's possible with Stuxnet destroying the centrifuges. We've seen hospitals taken offline uh, uh, 911 call centers taken offline. These uh, threats, these threats are real, and, and, and they're affecting each and every one of us. And I firmly believe it's a people problem in, in many ways. We click on everything, all of us. Email, gotta click it. Attachment, I don't care who it's from, I wanna see it. We click on everything. There was a study done, uh, not a study, I, I met a uh, internet security leader, basically somebody in charge of running security for an entire organization. He took 12 USB sticks, Sprinkled them around campus. 11 got plugged in within six hours. The last one got run over by a car. <laughs> we will plug, my alma mater did the same thing. Every USB was plugged in. Every, every USB was plugged in. We're the problem. We're also the solution. But we are the problem. I, um, I got an email, I was on a work trip. I got an email um, or a, a, a voicemail from my CFO, the guy that runs finances for the company. And he said, Marcin, this is inappropriate. Uh, I don't think we should be uh, approving wires this way. I went, what the hell are you talking about? What, what wires? What? So it turns out I had sent an email to Mark saying, if you don't approve this $52,000 wire, we're going to have a problem. 
and I apparently was very, very rough with him uh, through email. Now, I, notice no quotes, had no idea what he was talking about. So I asked him, and turns out he put a $52,000 wire into the system to some bank account overseas, and it was pending my approval. Had we not had that approval process locked down, $52,000 would have disappeared from Malwarebytes' bank account, never to be seen again. This has happened to the tune of tens of millions of dollars from some of the biggest companies in the world, and it's called wire fraud, CFO fraud. And social engineering makes it easy. All they had to do was go to our LinkedIn uh, website where you could see Malwarebytes' CFO, Mark Harris. Gee, I wonder how to guess his email address. It's pretty darn easy. So be careful as, as, as people listening to me here, what you expose online, uh, because it, it will come back and bite you. So the lack of cybersecurity professionals is real. There's, there's an estimate of 200,000 people missing in that profession. And if we can't attract that talent, and if we can't innovate, we as a society are not going to be in great shape. And we're already seeing it in day-to-day -day life, not that we haven't, but you look at the, the presidential election. I mean, cybersecurity was at the forefront with allegedly uh, you know, Russia's involvement in the DNC hacks. So again, if I leave here having convinced just one of you to join the fight in cybersecurity, I've done my job. Thank you.